to watch it on demand after the webinar. So thank you, Christine. Okay, and we're gonna go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone to Plan for Success, the benefits of building transportation demand management into your project from the start. A little background on how we brought this webinar to you. Best Workplaces for Commuters and the Association for Commuter Transportation partnered to bring interested people from across the nation together during TDM week. Uh, ACT, the Association for Commuter Transportation, is a leading advocate for commuter transportation and transportation demand management, TDM. You'll be hearing a lot about that. Um, also, we worked with a chapter of ACT called the SEAC chapter, and I want to uh, thank them for helping pull this together. And they include members from Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, North Carolina, Puerto Rico, South Carolina, and Tennessee. So thank you to all of them. And a little about Best Workplaces. Best Workplaces for Commuters demonstrates that options for commuting, such as transit, carpools, vanpools, and teleworking, are economically and environmentally beneficial, yielding value to workers, employees, and our communities. So a look at today's program. Our program today is gonna to include a lively panel discussion. I'll introduce our members in just a minute. You can ask questions anytime by using the Q&A feature, or you can chat with other participants. We encourage both. Uh, when asking a question for a specific panelist, please include their name at the beginning so we know who to direct your question to. And at the end of the webinar, please complete our short evaluation. Uh, we always look forward to hearing from you. And also, if you are on social media, uh, please use hashtag TDM week on all your posts. Um, we'd love for you to do that. If you're uh, uh, posting something about this webinar, make sure you use that uh, hashtag TDM week. Okay. Um, TDM week is de designed to create awareness among elected officials, DOTs, and government transit and planning agencies. And it's designed to um, create that awareness around the importance of including safe and reliable modes of transportation for all users in the transportation planning process. It also encourages employers to adopt TDM principles and programs within their corporate culture. So whether you're in human resource or facility planning, it's to provide viable incentives and amenities that reduce the carbon footprint of their employees' commute. And TDM is all week. We, there's lots of great activities going on from September 18th to 22nd. So what is transportation demand management or TDM? Uh, this is the definition from the Association for Commuter Transportation. And you can go to the link to find out more. We'll be talking about TDM. Uh, transportation demand management is the use of strategies to inform and encourage travelers to maximize the efficiency of our transportation systems, leading to improved mobility, reduced congestion, and lower vehicle emissions. TDM aims to provide all people with real transportation options that enable them to travel from their, their location to a destination in an affordable, efficient, and sustainable way. And you can go to that link if you want to hear more, but we'll be talking about TDM throughout this webinar. And before I turn the time over uh, and introduce our panelists, I wanted uh, to uh, talk a little bit about our commuter assistance programs here in Florida. Um, I am at the Center for Urban Transportation Research at the University of South Florida. We're located in Tampa. And we are thankful to all the commuter assistance programs we have in Florida. Uh, the Florida Department of Transportation is divided into seven districts. And you can see those uh, in different colors on the slide. So I just want to thank and congratulate for all their efforts uh, during this week and all year. Uh, in District 1, Commute Connector. In District 2, North Florida Transportation Planning Organization. In District 3, Ride On Commuter Services. In District 5, Rethink Your Commute. Districts 4 and 6 are covered by South Florida Commuter Services. And District 7, Commute Tampa Bay. And another uh, location, if you want to learn more about uh, Florida's commuter assistance programs, you can go to commuterservices.com. Okay, so 
now uh, what you've all been waiting for. We are going to um, turn the time over to our moderator, Wit, but I'm going to do the introductions for our three uh, members. And it looks like, uh, Christine, you have another poll up right now. And so uh, while I do introductions, you can uh, take the poll. How would you rate the maturity of the TDM program in your area? And infancy, young and growing, mature program, or don't know? So while I uh, introduce the panelists, uh, please take the poll. Uh, Whip Blanton is going to serve as both the moderator and a panelist, and he's the executive director of Ford Pinellas, the countywide planning agency and metropolitan planning organization serving Pinellas County. And since 2015, he's led a land use and transportation planning team of 18 staff, and he reports to a 13 member board of elected officials. Uh, prior to his role at Ford Pinellas, he was a founding owner and vice president of Renaissance Planning Group in Orlando. He's taught courses for the National Transit Institute on transit-oriented development and land use and transportation planning. Uh, Wood is also the 2023-2024 president of the Florida chapter of the American Planning Association, APA, and he earned induction in the AICP College of Fellows in 2012. So now you're going to look forward to hearing from him. Um, next, we have Amanda Kristen, and she's a multimodal transportation manager with over 17 years of versatility in the transportation planning space. She began her career in Virginia working as the city transportation planner assigned to all things transit, principally station area planning and transit oriented development for the Tide Light Rail in Norfolk. She brought that experience with her to HDR Engineering, where she spent seven years planning and managing light rail, streetcar, and heavy rail environmental studies. She's been with the Broward MPO since 2020 and has managed a variety of projects from the latest uh, Broward's Bicycle Suitability Map. Um, so we look forward to hearing from you also, Amanda. And then we have Eric Hill, uh, who's located in the middle of the state. He's been employed in the transportation industry in the state of Florida since 1999. Uh, his career in the transportation industry includes progressively responsible positions with the Transit Agency, Planning Authority, and Transportation Research Center. His current position is Director of Transportation Systems Management and Operations, TSMO. We're going to be hearing a lot about that uh, for Metro Plan Orlando the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Orlando Urbanized Area, including three counties. Um, he's responsible for planning and implementing TSMO strategies that use information and communication technologies for the transportation network within the Metropolitan Planning Area. So with that, I welcome all three of our panelists and Wit, I am going to turn the time over to you now. Okay, well, thank you very much, Julie. And as I get started, we do have the results of the Rate Your TDM poll here. So you can see it looks like we've got a few folks with mature uh, programs and others with young and growing programs. And that looks like the majority uh, of the responses. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody here. And uh, the way we're going to run the uh, panel discussion today is we're each going to spend about five minutes uh, giving a little bit of an overview of uh, our organizations and the work that we're doing. And then we're going to have more of a conversation uh, about how we build TDM into all of our planning projects, all of our transportation initiatives, and uh, how we start with, from the ground up on that. And I look forward to just some good feedback. And if you have questions, uh, please feel free to submit those questions uh, and type them into the Q&A or the chat. So I'm going to start with uh, an overview of Pinellas County, and uh, we are in the Tampa Bay area, and uh, we have um, a, a lot of unique situations and advantages that I like to I like to call them advantages. Uh, we are the most densely populated county in the state of Florida. It's because we're the second smallest county by geography, and we have about a million people uh, living in Pinellas County. We also have about 15 million tourists who come and visit our beaches um, every year. What's interesting, though, is that we are not just a tourism-driven economy. We are second in the state in manufacturing jobs uh, after Miami-Dade. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have a real interesting mix of uh, high-wage employment and fairly low-wage tourism economy. Uh, we are a redeveloping county. We have almost no green space or open space left for development. 
Most of our growth was happening in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, and we pretty much filled up the whole county. Um, unfortunately, a lot of it was suburban sprawl type, type development, but one of our advantages is we have 24 cities, and in those 24 cities, we have a lot of very walkable uh, downtowns with a lot of destinations within a one to three mile difference distance. Next slide, please. Ford Pinellas is a unique agency in the state of Florida. In 2014, the state legislature, uh, acting upon local requests, uh, moved to merge our agency into, uh, so we have a MPO, Metropolitan Planning Organization, merged with a countywide land use planning agency. And the elected officials that serve on my board hear both land use cases and transportation and make transportation decisions. And we do our best to try and link those too. And we are funded through a, um, a property tax millage that, um, that provides the basis for our funding before we are reimbursed through the federal government for our MPO activities. So we serve as a uh, forum for countywide decision-making on land use and transportation issues. We establish transportation priorities just like every MPO in the country does. And we provide technical assistance to our 25 local governments uh, on land use issues, on transportation issues, and a lot of our local governments are smaller, so we essentially are their staff on these issues. Next slide, please. I'd like to just highlight a few things that we've been working on in recent years. Uh, this is the Pinellas Trail, which started in 1990, and it started with a one-mile segment in the city of Largo, and it has grown to 57 miles of uh, county-maintained trail uh, that is becoming an entire loop around the county. It will soon be 75 miles uh, with the remaining two segments um, close to being under construction. Cool. And part of it is an abandoned rail corridor, uh, but it is a generally about a 15 foot wide trail uh, that allows for commuting, it allows for recreation and exercise. And we do counts on the trail. And since the pandemic, those counts have ballooned. Uh, we use infrared cameras to record that, and we are now at routinely over 2 million trail users every year. And now we're working on the east-west connections into that uh, trail network. We have a few, but we've got a few more to get done. Next slide. I'm really happy to uh, announce that uh, we've just passed the 1 million rider mark on our new bus rapid transit project, uh, the Sun Runner which uh, goes from downtown St. Petersburg to St. Pete Beach. Uh, so it connects our beach and our workers who uh, work in the tourism industry out in the beach communities, but really can't afford to live out there. Um, and they um, travel that 10.3 mile route. And it is full of interesting uh, mix of people. A lot of tourists use it, a lot of workers use it, and a lot of people going to the Tampa Bay Rays baseball games and museums and things like that. Um, it has a dedicated uh, bus and turn lane uh, that operates um, adjacent to Central Avenue, which is the main commercial corridor traveling east-west in, in St. Petersburg. And after many, many years of trying, this was our first successful federal capital investment grant in the Tampa Bay region. So we're hoping that this will be a catalyst to more of those kinds of grants uh, as we work to expand what's a pretty anemic transit system in the Tampa Bay region, but this is a great start to that and we hope to build on it in coming years. Next slide, please. Uh, I'd also like to talk about our downtown St. Pete mobility study that we finished last year. And this was an effort to um, look at the growth in downtown St. Petersburg, which has had a lot of growth in the last few years. It was a pretty moribund downtown in the 1990s, 1980s. Um, had declined over many decades, and then it had a re resurgence and rebirth uh, in the early 2000s, largely due to the artists and uh, pioneers who came back to downtown. A lot of young folks have moved into downtown, and now it's getting too expensive for the young folks to live there, unfortunately. Uh, but we looked at uh, the entire downtown network to focus on how we could make the network safer, more connected, and reduce some of the barriers that have occurred over the years focusing primarily on the interstate spurs of I-175 and I-375 that connect out to the main interstate of I-275. Those historically have separated um, black and brown neighborhoods from the downtown and the employment opportunities that they present. They've also separated other neighborhoods from downtown. In completing the study, we are advancing 
um, um, an alternative study to look at a possible conversion of I-175 into a boulevard. And uh, we are also looking at converting several one-way uh, streets that are notoriously fast and full of crashes into two-way slower streets with pedestrian and bicycle, room for pedestrian and bicycle activities. Um, so this was a, an important catalyst project that looked at the growth in downtown. Next slide. And for the last slide that I have is um, something I'm really proud of is the Gateway Master Plan. This was an area covering about 30 square miles near the St. Pete Clearwater International Airport, an area that long had been sort of the not in my backyard uses of jail and airport and uh, a lot of major employers in this area, but it's uh, linked to the Tampa area through Interstate 275 uh, and major highways. Uh, this is an area where we wanted to bring more housing, more diversity of uses uh, into the area and develop more of a transportation network, a multimodal transportation network. And I went to my four member local governments there and I said, if you put $100,000 in, I'll put $100,000 in and I'll get the State Department of Transportation to match that. And lo and behold, uh, the Florida Department of Transportation came up with the money and we had about a million two to conduct this gateway area master plan. And we are using it to guide land use and transportation decision-making to move away from a single use campus style office environment and back office manufacturing uh, area into more of a thriving, vibrant uh, live work play community. And it's going to take 30 years to do it, but we are making some progress in this area. And I think the next slide is just my contact information. Uh, so that is my information if you'd like to follow up on any of this. And then we will transition to our next panel member. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Okay, I will. Hi, everyone. My name is Amanda Christen. I'm the transit manager here at the Broward Metropolitan Planning Organization um, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, and it's my pleasure to be here today. Next slide, please. So we were tasked with a five minute spiel about where you are from uh, to give folks uh, all over Florida and others that are on this webinar today, a little bit of a, a touch point of where, um, where I exist in the transit world. So I am in the Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Pompano Beach, MSA, that's a metropolitan statistical area for those planner geeks out there. We have about 6 million people in this MSA. And some interesting statistics is 70% uh, drive alone to work. This is according to the American Community Survey information. And uh, the mean commute time is 29 minutes. And only 60% of the housing units in uh, this area in the MSA are owner occupied. So that gives a little bit of demographic information and a little perspective of, of who may be a transit rider um, or take advantage of TDM. Uh, narrowing our focus to Broward County, Broward has, as of this year, at the end of this year, we'll have 2 million residents. We are a single county MPO. Um, so that means we have 31 cities in Broward, all of whom comprise the, the regional planning board, the MPO. Uh, we have lots of different forms of transportation in Broward, regional rail or commuter rail, a commercial passenger rail in the form of Brightline, um, of which many of you are likely familiar, uh, express bus, fixed route bus, community shuttles. We have a pretty robust community shuttle network uh, in our uh, member cities. Uh, two micro, micro transit providers, um, as well as a bike share. Its locus is Fort Lauderdale downtown, and we have a water trolley system. Next slide. Um, we have, like I said, we have 31 municipalities. It actually starts north of Pompano Beach, my graphic cut off Deerfield Beach. So if anyone is from Deerfield on this call, um, I apologize. Uh, we have Broward County Transit, South Florida Commuter Services, as Julie mentioned earlier, and a new entity, which is a partnership between um, the Greater Fort Lauderdale Transportation Management Association and the Broward MPO called Commute Broward. And Commute Broward is intended to fill the gaps where South Florida Commuter Services 
uh, leaves some travelers behind, some commuters behind. So we passed the penny for transportation uh, surtax in 2018. The oversight committee of that penny surtax is called the Mobility Advancement Program. So the MPO works very closely with the MAP program uh, to identify it, projects that are ready for completion through Broward County. And um, also we're working with Broward County Transit as they uh, implement their transit system-wide plan update. It was completed in 2023. It's colloquially called PRIMO plan for premium mobility. And it is a pretty big integration of fixed rail in the form of an um, an expansion of an existing commuter rail project, a commuter rail system, uh, light rail, and uh, an extensive robust bus rapid transit system, as well as an expanded high frequency fixed route bus system. So uh, the actual implementation will begin in 2028. Um, and so we're very excited about that. Next slide, please. I think it's just me, yeah. So that's my, my synopsis of Broward and the transit system in Broward, and I look forward to today's discussion. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I presume I am up next. Uh, my name is Eric Hill. I'm Director of Transportation Systems Management Operations for Metro Plan Orlando. Uh, we are the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Orlando Urbanized Area. And just to pick up on some comments uh, from our previous speakers, uh, yes, we are in the center of the state. We consider ourselves the center of the universe in terms of transportation in the state of Florida, because all roads connect through Orlando somehow. And we also consider ourselves uh, a regional transportation partnership. Uh, here are the logos of the jurisdictions that represent our board. Next slide. So in Central Florida, uh, we are an MPO, uh, three counties, uh, 22 cities, 2.2 million people. Um, and at any particular day of the week, uh, that number is quadrupled by the number of visitors that we get. So although we uh, consider 2.2 million people, a lot of people, um, it grows every day. Um, it will continue to grow. Um, although I am uh, more responsible for how we use technology and transportation, just again, picking up on previous comments, um, what we do is use that, that, that technology to collect data, to transmit information, and both are used to allow individuals to make choices in how they choose to travel, whether they're using transit, using the trails, walking, or working at home. Uh, we are able to use technology to connect people, but also give them information on the choices that they have in making trips. Now, I guess you could argue that TISMO is part of TDM or that TDM is part of TISMO. Doesn't matter to me because in either case, we are trying to build a transportation network that is not dependent on people driving by themselves, people putting more cars on the road, because there are many instances where driving and driving alone does not help what we're trying to do in building mobility, safety, and reliability in our transportation network. Next slide. So here is a look of where we are trying to get to in 20. 45, we expect 1 million more people, 3.2 million people. And we expect the tourists to increase along with that. Uh, we are looking at more freight and goods services. Uh, coming out of the pandemic, we saw more freight vehicles on the road, service delivery vehicles on the road. And so we need to figure out a way to manage that traffic as well. We expect our transportation network to mature. And we are quickly reaching the point where I think everyone is accepting that you can't build your way out of congestion. 
And if you combine that with the next item, which is driverless vehicles, and before you get to driverless vehicles, we already have vehicles that are more efficient in terms of fuel uh, and electric vehicles. And in either case, the revenue that we have relied on, the traditional transportation finance model, is, is no longer useful. Uh, so we need to figure out a way to manage mobility much more effectively. And then as we look out into the future, there are many unknowns. Will there be another pandemic? Um, will there be, and this is the, the, the story I used, to, I used to use a lot, is uh, I guess it's now, let's say five to seven years, you know, Uber was, was German for grandiose. Uh, and then it became a $6.1 billion company. Well, do we expect more of those type of unknowns to appear? And if they do, how will they impact how we plan for our transportation system? Next slide. And uh, Julie already mentioned that in District 5, which is where Metro Plan Orlando is, we have Rethink Program uh, as our community assistance program. This is uh, operated and managed by one of the consultants by for the DOT District 5. And they do all the necessary work to identify employers, identify employees that could use uh, commute alternatives, building car, carpools, um, alternative ways to get to work and to get home, uh, and to exercise or inform employers of these opportunities, and perhaps even um, things such as tax benefits um, in other ways that their employees can, can decide on how they're going to travel to work and home. Next slide. So in the Orlando Kissimmee Sanford area, which is the area that we are in, um, I pulled together uh, just some, some information on mode shares for, for our region. Um, because one of the things that, that I am curious uh, about TDM, and that is, what is the state of TDM? Um, and so I pulled these data uh, from the census just to, uh, just to make everybody aware of our region and, and our mode shares in our region. And, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt that these, these data are, any, are that much different from, from Witt's area or, or Amanda's area. But I think that the, the challenge here, uh, as I see it, is, is transit. How do we build a stronger transit presence in terms of how we are educating uh, commuters on their, their trip alternatives? And how do we build that? How do we invest more in transit? Um, the other one is working from home. Uh, of course, that was really an area that saw a lot of growth as a result of the pandemic. Um, and some of these numbers, you know, these are estimates, and some of these numbers are, are changing, they're trending, they're trending, um, such as more carpools, um, people that are working at home. While there is a trend to continue that, but I think it's plateaued uh, from what I gather from just the, the uh, information that I read I've been exposed to, more employers are starting to require that their employees come back into the office, if not five days a week, three days out of the week. But again, uh, I, I believe that that only makes things a little bit more challenging for us as we're trying to build the TDM world or ecosystem by, again, encouraging people to use other means of work. And, and, I, and I believe that historically, uh, it has been uh, the working from home that always had the major share. We talk about mode shares other than single occupancy vehicles. So I, the next slide is my final slide, and that's just information on how to reach me if you are interested in learning more about Metro Plan Orlando, uh, what we're doing in the TISMA world, but also what we're doing with TDA. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Amanda. Um, again, just a reminder that if you have questions, uh, you can type them into the Q&A and we'll do our best to respond to them. Uh, if not, in this next 30 minutes, we'll do it um, uh, by email if, if we can. Um, 
wanted to just touch on Eric, what you um, uh, highlighted there about working from home. You know, it wasn't too long ago where we were just pleading for employers and employees to have one day where they could just work from home and it would make a big difference in our transportation patterns and travel patterns. And now it seems like employers are pleading for people to come back into the office for just two days a week. <laughs> um, and it's had a pretty big difference. And I guess I'd like the panel members, each of you to, to maybe talk a little bit about how that difference has affected your area. Uh, and I'll start with Amanda and then maybe go to Eric, but um, has working from home, have you seen some big shifts in travel patterns and tendencies? Thank you. Um, well, we in Broward have not seen as discernible a shift as other parts of Florida, I would say at the very least. Um, you know, our economy is such that, it, and it's similar to what you were saying about manufacturing and as well as like service, our economy is such that we have very high, high tech, um, you know, data driven uh, professions, but we have a preponderance of our, our folks, our service sector, uh, what we call, what we are continuing to call like our frontline workers. We have lots and lots of those. And um, as we all know, from the outcomes of the pandemic, those people cannot work from home. So um, I, you know, we saw a, a moderate reduction in VMT at the beginning of the pandemic, um, you know, on our interstate system, but it, it has not uh, maintained. So, you know, I can just, just hasn't been, been the case for us. How about you, Eric? So, <clears throat> We, uh, as you mentioned, we have a major hospitality industry, and and many of the employees in this industry they don't have that option. And so, um, while that has always been a challenge, um, what has exacerbated has been the growth that we have been going on in Central Florida, mm -hmm. um, because. As I noted, we are the center of the state, so you can go all the way around us and and follow your traffic into the center of the center part of the state. Unlike uh, with circumstance, uh, he's uh, a peninsula. He is uh, pretty much landlocked. He, as you noted, he has the highest density population density in the state for uh, for county. And some of that is similar to what your challenges are, uh, Amanda. Um, so what we have been observing is that the numbers have started to trend upward in terms of congestion, uh, in terms of uh, travel time, uh, unreliability, and and a lot of that has it, it has started to get back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, and what we haven't been doing again is perhaps telling the story to employers, employees, or alternative ways that they can commute. Um, now, not only is that a, a issue for congestion, but it's an issue for air quality, it's an issue for safety, because the more vehicles you have on the road, the more likely that you're going to have a vehicle crash. So those are the, the, the challenges um, that we have in Central Florida. Uh, and again, some of it, uh, a lot of it is due to the growth. Um, you know, the pandemic, and, and this is no, this is not, you know, newsworthy, but the pandemic attracted many people to the state of Florida. And they came to the central part of the state of Florida. Uh, and, and in addition to the growth, our region is growing. Um, uh, central Florida is connected by Interstate 4. And in, as someone who travels Interstate 4 between Orlando and Tampa, um, I can tell you from just experience that the, the congestion has come back. Um, and we can't keep up with it. You know, I know that we can't build our way out of congestion. Uh, we just don't have the funding for it. Uh, so so that's, that's my perspective on it. Okay, very good. 
I guess from my perspective, what we saw is um, you, to echo both your points, uh, the congestion didn't really go away when you're growing by 800 to 1,000 new residents a day, um, as this state is, um, it's going to overwhelm you pretty quickly. So, but we did see a pattern shift in, in travel time, travel um, like, for instance, uh, early morning uh, travel is pretty much a breeze still for us here in Pinellas County compared to what it was in 2019 or 2018. But the afternoon travel, that peak has spread. So it's now 2 to 7 p.m. And there was a lot more people on the road in the afternoons. And I think maybe some of the flexibility that people have in their jobs is giving um, some people the ability to uh, do other errands and, and maybe spend time uh, visiting with um, their, their children at, at you know, after school activities, taking them places and things like that. So the traffic's out there. Uh, it's, it's just the morning commute seems like it's a little easier uh, in our area. I don't know how long that'll last, but that's been one thing I've observed. Just to, um, parlaying on that reliability, Eric, that you mentioned, the travel time reliability, you've got a pretty interesting project in the Orlando area, which is the Ultimate I-4 project. And I know in Southeast Florida on I-95, we have managed toll lanes in, in operation there. So I-4 has these new managed toll lanes we're about to get them in uh, the Tampa Bay area on I-275. And I wonder what each of you think about managed toll lanes as um, a, a mechanism to manage travel demand. Well, you know that, that, um, you know that saying, if you build it, they will come. Uh, I can tell you from experience, um, when they opened, uh, of course they were free. And um, it did, relieve congestion in the general purpose lanes uh, as people got used to them. And of course they were free. Um, and, and I think they were free for about a month, but once they started charging, they didn't charge the full price and we still have it. Um, but if you build it, they will come. And I can tell you from experience, because I use them, uh, last week was the first time I, I actually used the managed lane and I came to a full stop because of the congestion. Hmm. So again, that to me, it, it, without even looking at any data, that trips are increasing, trips by cars are increasing, trips by freight vehicles are increasing. And again, it, it is it just it's just an indication of you know, the growth in our area. And, you know, there's the, the irony is that the congestion is an indication also of our economy. So we have a strong economy. So we have growth. So we have use and consumers can purchase vehicles. But I, I have to argue that with all this growth and all this, this um, income and revenue that we should be using other strategies besides the roadways to mm -hmm. to move uh, our citizens around, and and I and I believe when you look at in our area, one of the, the high growth counties in our area is Osceola County, which was pretty much you know all this area was used to just pretty much dairy land, but Osceola County is a county that it it was at one point the smallest county in our region, but it's close to the second largest now, but it is growing tremendously. Mm -hmm. And, and they didn't have, we didn't, we didn't prepare for this growth by creating the alternatives or creating the mechanism to move that traffic. Uh, and we're behind it, we're behind the curve now, but you know, we're working towards trying to, to figure it out as well. Amanda, before I ask you the same question, I just probably need to define managed toll lanes. These are lanes that have variable price tolls in response to congestion. And Eric, they're supposed to be able to maintain the travel speed at 45 miles an hour, but I guess you got to charge the full fare for that to happen. You you do, you yeah. do. It's it's you know it's uh, economic uh, behavioral economics. Uh, That's we, right. we haven't implemented that yet. Amanda, your thoughts on the topic? Yeah, I want. I'm glad that you made that clarification because I was thinking, is it a is a is it a hot lane or a you know a, a managed toll lane? So I'm glad that you. Uh, you clarified that. Um, 
you know, we we do have we do have express lane. We do have um they're they're well used. I, I use them myself. I have many times come to a complete stop uh when in them. Uh, my my, I guess, issue is that it's 50 cents to go practically three counties in the hot lanes. I call them hot lanes because I'm from Northern Virginia, and that's what we call our, our Beltway Express lanes. Um, so it, it seems to me like the, the intent is there, but maybe the implementation has not been fully realized because um, if I'm a person tra traveling alone in my car and I'm going from uh, Miami, Northern Miami-Dade County to Southern Palm Beach County and I'm taking I-95 and it costs me 50, 50 cents the whole way to, um, you know, take one of two lanes that are, you know, underutilized. I mean, I'm, I'm going to do it every every day of the week. So that 50 cents, I think, um, missed the mark a little bit. And I'm hoping our friends at FDOT um, will, they will revisit that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. It takes political will. And I think what the mm -hmm. department is afraid of is that if they did charge the full price that was needed to maintain 45 miles an hour, they would hear from it from county commissioners, city commissioners, and whatnot. And that would be some pretty fierce uh, pressure, but that's the goal. Um, and I guess related to that, and I'm gonna get to some questions here, we're starting to get a few in a minute, is the issue of parking. And we haven't mm -hmm. talked much about parking right now, but that's another place where there's an ability to moderate um, demand. And I just got finished reading a great book by the author Henry Graybar, which is, um, uh, paved Paradise, uh, How Parking Explains the World. And I really commend mm. the book. It's a very, very good book. It's good reporting that looks at a lot of case studies around the country about how parking has hindered affordable housing, has uh, created more congestion, uh, and it quotes extensively from Donald Shoup, who's sort of the, the godfather of parking out at UCLA. Um, are there any efforts um, that you're aware of in your respective urban areas to to change how parking policy is implemented at the local government level? I know Orlando at one point had a, a commute trip reduction program that involved um, restricted parking downtown, but I think they had to abandon it. So just curious, uh, Amanda, first you about parking and then turn to Eric. You know, I'll be... Frank, I don't know of any, and I believe that I, I had this conversation with someone not too long ago, and um, the the idea of parking maximums with new growth mm -hmm. is, I'm going to use a, a, <laughs> a transit uh, metaphor, is really the third rail down here. Um, you know, the idea of parking maximums for residential or commercial um, it, it just is not on the table. It's not on the table at all. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm addressing that, the parking perspective from maybe a different point of view, it, you know, in that there could be, um, I'm, I'm trying to get people to incentivize other modes or, um, maybe charge people a, a nominal fee to park in a garage in a downtown area and conversely give them that money to uh, take another mode of transportation or use it however they would like. Um, so those are conversations that are really in, in the inception phase right now here. And part of the work that we're trying to do, the MPO, the Broward MPO and Commute Broward is to reach out to those employers and to, you know, take a real grassroots approach to TDM in in an area where the single occupant vehicle is is king. Um, so, you know, we're we're really trying to have those conversations at the at the executive level with our large employers and to introduce those concepts as a as a viable alternative 
for for their you know from their doctors to their you know to their orderlies you know thinking about a, a large health healthcare uh, consortium here. No, very good point, Eric. Uh, any particular thoughts from your perspective? Yeah, uh, about fifteen years ago, I, I tried to uh, develop the whole notion of TDM as part of our artisanal program. Yeah. and uh, tried to reestablish what was it, it, prior to me joining Metro Plan Orlando, we had a downtown uh, partnership and it, it was a TDM. Uh, but it went away because they increased the amount of parking in downtown. So why do you need a TDM? Uh, so uh, we used to have one out at University of Central Florida, which is the second largest university in the country. Uh, but that went away because there's more parking. Um, we have one in, in our north portion of our region that went away because there's more and more parking. And, 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 and there is a correlation to that. If you're gonna create parking for people, uh, then they're gonna drive their vehicles. And you know, I think conversely to that, if you eliminate the park, then they do need to find alternatives. However, you do need to provide that alternative in the form of carpools, in the form of transit. Now, you saw our mode share, 1%, it, it, and, and that's on a good day, 1%, okay? Um, and we have, we have bus transit, we have um, commuter rail. Um, the Brightline service that Amanda mentioned is going to be uh, operating uh, from South Florida to Orlando. Um, so how do you get people to, how do we move that? How, how do we move the needle on transit? And, and part of that is, is the parking. Now, in, in terms of TISMO, we've done a lot with creating apps to make people aware of where parking opportunities are. And is that a good use of technology? I think it's a good show of technology, but you know, it's kind of like working against what if, if the goal is to get people out of vehicles into transit, we'll, you know, we need to balance, we need to balance that. We need to balance it. And let me let me conclude because I know you want to get to some of the questions and comments. My experience in, in the NPO world is working with elected officials. Um, when you want to get uh, something done, it really helps to have a champion. And and I think that's one of the things we're missing, at least in our area, is a champion for TDM. Because uh, again, that's been my experience on, on projects that I've completed. If you get it, I a board member that's going to be the person that's going to speak on your behalf, you will get traction and you will start to see results. If that board member is effective, absolutely. I agree with you 100%. Just in terms of parking, when I was a, an employer in the Orlando area, we made a decision to give our employees parking cash out uh, where we gave them, and this was you know going back a few years, but we gave them $80 a month that they could use for parking in lieu of providing for them a parking space. If they wanted to park in our class A office building in downtown Orlando, that was a lot more than $80 a month. That was probably 220 back then, 225. But there was parking, surface parking in downtown Orlando where $80 might cover it. I preferred mm -hmm. spending that on beer and riding my bicycle uh, to work. So, <laughs> you know, that was a good perk on my end. But giving people the means of making those decisions on their own. Um, I'm a big believer in that. Um, let's take a look at some of the questions we have here. Um, we have a question about how do you think the commuter assistance program in your region can better engage with the MPO? We're all MPO uh, people here. Um, is there is there room for improvement? Well, I, you know, our commuter assistance program here in Broward and in Miami-Dade is South Florida Commuter Services. And um, we have we have an excellent relationship with South Florida Commuter Services, but I do wish that uh, either they or we had the had the opportunity to have a member of their organization of the CAP on our, or attend our technical advisory committee meeting, or to be on our citizens advisory committee, or to have dedicated staff to go to our, um, our board meetings every month um, and take that 
three minutes of open time, or if they're allotted a seat, if we change the county charter, you know, that would be even more great. Um, just so that we know with the boots on the ground, with their outreach folks, where the problems are, where the successes are, and how we as an MPO can help to, you know, support planning and projects in, in those areas, as well as how we can identify and funnel funds and, and you know, a means to actually achieving the goals of these programs that are developed in tandem with, with the MPO's goals. Um, I really do think that there's great opportunity for there to be more integration and more engagement with our um, commuter assistant program folks. And it, that's not just in Broward. I think it's all over the country, actually, you know, save for pockets of the Pacific Northwest. I think that uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, a challenge that we have of keeping our singular goals and objectives, um, you know, in four of mine, but also integrating them and, you know, finding the funds uh, to really support the programs that they, as people that are, you know, at those park and ride lots every day or on the express bus every day, you know, what they see that we need. Yeah, we have pre-pandemic, we had a pretty active relationship with um, Rethink and we would have their, um, person that was leading that effort was managing the project. We had like quarterly presentations by that individual. They would come in, give us a report on how they're doing uh, because we considered it part of our TISMO program. Um, but then the pandemic happened and we kind of, it kind of fell off, but we still had some discussion and at the, I can recall the last discussion we had with them was how do we start to get to those employees that we've left out. We typically look at the office employees. Let's start looking at some of these hospitality employees. Mm -hmm. If they're all going to the same hotel, mm -hmm. is there a way for us to put them in one vehicle or multiple vehicles? But it kind of fell off during the pandemic. And it, in essence, you know, as, a, as an organization, we started to practice what we preach, the teleworking. Um, but it's fallen off and we, uh, I believe we as an agency, we need to re-energize ourselves and start to work more in that direction. Um, as I said, we, we, want to, we want to increase that mode uh, of transit. We, we want to increase that. And I'll just conclude real quick with this story, uh, personal story, and it just came to mind. Uh, I moved to Florida from Albany, New York. And uh, I can recall one morning, and to show you the difference in culture, one morning I, I drove my wife to work and she worked in the Capitol. And so I pulled into what was a bus loading, unloading, mm. alighting zone. I didn't know it, but I thought mm. I was going to be able to pull up real fast, drop her off. But what happened when I pulled her off, pulled up, she got out, buses started lining up next to me and I got trapped. <laughs> and people were getting off the bus. They were going past my car. So many went past my car and hit my side view mirror that it broke. And it was a hard lesson. But it also gave me a strong indication of how supported the transit system was then. And I'm going back several years. But could would we or could would you see something like that happening in Florida? Not likely. <laughs> So we just need to focus more. And again, I, I would think that, again, having a champion, and maybe it's not the champion of TDM, but the champion of alternative modes of transportation yeah. is, is what we yeah. need to think about. Hi, I, I just want to speak to that a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, well, thinking about what, what you just said, Eric, about who who the target audience is of some of these TDM efforts, like, like I, I said earlier, the Broward MPO is is working with the, the TMA in Fort Lauderdale, the greater Fort Lauderdale area, to grow this organization called Commute Broward that is intended to bridge that gap. And this is something innovative for us. Um, this this partnership, this this real interest in finding ways for these folks 
to get to work um, that are safe and convenient and affordable and offer folks that don't have a single, you know, don't have a car to drive, offer them real viable transportation alternatives. So, you know, again, we're, we're very excited about it. We feel very um, honored to be a part of, of this, this Commute Broward uh, grassroots effort. So, you know, we'll report back and tell, let you know how it goes. Yeah. Well, we just have a couple of minutes left. I wanted to address another question here, which is how TDM, how is TDM integrated into large capital and TISMO projects in your area? And give an example here, and then maybe one of you can chime in quickly, is we have a $1.3 billion interchange project called the West Shore Interchange in Tampa, which is uh, near the Tampa International Airport. And our strategy is to work with the Florida Department of Transportation during the six years of construction, maybe it's nine years, I forget, but it's a lot, is to have a maintenance of traffic program where while that construction is happening, that we are using uh, funds that the state and federal government make available to us to operate transit service, um, express transit service in that corridor to give people an option because the congestion is going to be bad. <laughs> that you can't do a major construction project like that without really disrupting people's travel times. And then the corollary of that is getting people to shift um, to work from home, um, not have to use that same route if possible. Um, but it's one of three bridges that connects um, our, our two major counties of employment. And there's a lot of work trips that go between Pinellas County and Hillsborough County. So using maintenance of traffic and the department seems open to that. I think we just really have to have a champion, have some leaders and maybe work together for a change as a region to um, advocate for that MOT program to see if that can get implemented. Any other quick stories either of you can share on integrating TDM into major capital projects? Well, not, not, go ahead a minute. No, I was just gonna say that, you know, the only thing that we're doing you know, it's not necessarily into major capital projects right now, but we really have begun with our new transfer, our new congestion management process to actually put TDM, um, you know, if, give parity to TDM and those engineering solutions to some of these real problems that we have in these, you know, 81 congested corridors in Broward County. So. Uh, you know, that's kind of a sea change for us is getting TDM into our metropolitan transportation plan. Um, it's called Route to 2050, this this uh, this five year cohort. Um, and, you know, I'm excited to see how that plays out. I'm excited to know that transportation demand management um, strategies are you know, given some real importance now in, in Broward. So I think that's exciting for us. Eric? Yeah, so uh, we are, are almost complete with a TISMO master plan. And one of the recommendations in that master plan is, is how, we, how we can change project scoping so that as capital projects are being scoped, they're being designed, as they move along the continuum, where will TISMO pop up as, okay, let's integrate TISMO. Same thing with TDM, where will it pop up? At least with TISMO, we want to encourage the department and the maintaining agencies as they're scoping these projects, consider where TISMO pops up. Now, I mentioned earlier, TISMO and TDM is like a blurred line there because what we're doing in TISMO supports TDM because it's providing information, decision-making support. So along that continuum, where does it pop up? Where's the opportunity? And include your TISMO TDM planners in the project scoping exercise. You know, Don't create the bubble and at the tail end say, oh yeah, we should have brought you. Bring them to Bingo. the table at the beginning. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much um, to Eric and Amanda so much. We really appreciate your time. And thanks to the audience for being here today. Um, and then Christine or Julie, is, Julie, is there anything you'd like to say at the end? 
Um, yes, I just really want to thank all three of you. Um, what there's one more burning question for you though, are the counters on the Pinellas Trail permanent? Yes, hmm. we have permanent counters on the Pinellas <laughs> Trail. They are infrared cameras. Um, we have about, if I remember right, about eight of them, uh, not enough. And so we are now in the process of purchasing both additional permanent counters and some temporary counters that we can move around, not temporary, but you know what I mean, that we can move around to different locations. Great, okay. Um, I think we needed more time. This was such a great <laughs> conversation and I know everyone was engaged. And again, just thank you so much for taking uh, the time. Quickly, if you're interested in joining Best Workplaces for Commuters, our application uh, process is open through November 30th and our national list release will be announced on January, 2024. And next slide, Christine. And this is just our final slide. Again, it is TDM week all week. Um, hashtag TDM week on all of your social media. And there's some really great things going on this week and more webinars uh, and lots of things happening on a nationwide basis. Uh, so again, thank you so much. And we just look forward to seeing all the great things you're doing in your different areas across the state of Florida. Uh, thank you. Julie, Julie, if I can, great job, Whit. Thank you. Yes, great Thanks, job, everybody. Thank you. He, that, he did. Great job moderating. <laughs> and, all, and Amanda and Eric, really great and Christine, uh, answers. Christine, thank you. Yes. Yes, thank Christine, you thank you so much uh, for, for putting this uh, together. Um, we had a very large audience, so that was great. And again, the recording will be available for on-demand playback for anyone who was not able to attend. Thank, thank, you. thank, thank you. you. And thank you, Julie. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.